Hello and welcome everyone to today's presentation. Today I will be showing you one of the most anticipated features in the upcoming 2022 version of Geographics and that is our Python integration. Uh, during the presentation we will look at two examples. Uh, the first one is an example of a supervised learning algorithm where we will take some curve data from Geographics, use it to predict another curve and then push the predicted curve back into the database. The second example is where we will grab some zone attributes from zone manager and run an unsupervised learning algorithm to come up with a trackability parameter that we will write back into zone manager as an attribute. But before I get to that, let's talk about our approach to achieve this integration. Uh, we've tried not to reinvent the wheel. There are numerous Python development environments out there. And instead of creating an editor within geographics and asking people to use that, our approach has been to simply write an API that you can include in any Python script that you have and use whichever editor that you prefer. So it is essentially a Geographics Python library. You include it in your script and you use it to extract data from the Geographics project. Use this data to run your scripts and then if you want to, you can push the results back into the Geographics database. And uh, we've exposed almost everything in the database and in the project through this API. So you can access all your well data. Uh, that includes header information, formation picks, curve data, completions and perforations, uh, production information. Almost any piece of data in the well database is accessible. And uh, on top of that, other information stored in the project. So all your well filters, zone manager zones and attributes, source lists, strat columns, grids, isomap layers, even seismic volumes. Uh, so the Geographics Python API lets you work with all that information that's available inside your project. Um, and we've tried to make configuring the whole thing as easy as possible as well. It is basically a one-click setup. Everything you need to run this Python uh, setup is automatically downloaded, installed, and ready to go with minimum fuss. We create a virtual environment which helps isolate the Python runtime environment from any other versions of Python that you may already have installed. So doesn't interfere with other work that you're doing already doing um, using other applications. So that was a brief overview of how this whole thing is set up. Uh, now let me take you through the example and we're going to see the Python API in action. But before we do that, let me show you how to access the Python API in Geographics. There is a new menu in Project Explorer called Python. This launches the Python environment selector. Now, if this is the first time you're running this API and your workstation is not configured to run Python with Geographics, this will automatically download everything that is required, all the packages, the runtime, and set it all up. Now, it doesn't really take too long, and once all of this is done, you're ready to start working with the Geographics Python API. As I mentioned earlier, you don't need any specific editor or development environment to run this. We've packaged Jupyter Notebook into the install. Uh, this is one of the most popular Python editor, uh, and you can launch that directly by making this selection here. Um, if you prefer to use something else, just launch via the command line and run your preferred editor from there. Uh, we will be adding a few other popular editor options in the future, but I will be using Jupyter Notebook for the example workflows that I'll be going through in just a minute. Okay, so when you launch this, it will take you to the location where you have all your scripts. Uh, now we're shipping this examples folder with the Python API. This helps you understand how to use the API. We're also working on a comprehensive help file uh, that details the API in terms of the inputs required and the outputs you can expect. The API utilizes some popular open source uh, Python libraries. We make use of packages like pandas and numpy and other common Python libraries. Now, these are widely used in the Python community for easy data manipulation, data visualization, and for running you know, advanced calculations and machine learning algorithms. So you won't find any specialized data structures that you may never have come across in your Python scripting before. Again, the idea here is to enable you to use data from geographics easily um, in your Python scripts. Okay, so let's get down to some actual scripts, some real examples. The first script that I'm gonna show you is where I have some wells that have a lot of log curves, but a couple of those wells don't have a sonic curve. To get the missing sonic curves, we can use a supervised learning algorithm, which is a machine learning technique where you train a model using known inputs and known outputs, and then use that model to generate predictions for new input data. And the workflow I'm following here is a typical machine learning workflow. Uh, we will read data from our data source, 
This is going to be log data from the geographics database. So we'll read that in. Uh, we'll do some pre-processing on it, basically to get it ready so that we can train a model that uses some of those logs to predict a sonic curve. We will run a blind test. A blind test uses the model to predict outputs from a set of input data and then compares the prediction to actual real world data. So the well we, use, we will use for our blind testing uh, does have a sonic curve, but we will not use this well to train our model. We'll keep it hidden from the model. We'll treat it as if it does not have a sonic curve. What we'll do instead is that we will use the model to predict a sonic curve for this well. And since, since this well already has a real sonic curve, that gives us real world data to compare the prediction to. This is important to verify whether our model works on inputs that were not used to train it. And once we're happy with our model, we will then use it to predict the curves for a well that don't have a DD curve uh, altogether. Like no DD curve. This is not like hiding the well from the model. This is not blind testing the actual, the actual prediction. Uh, and then we'll push the curve back into the geographics database where it is then available as any other curve. It's a curve in a curve set. So the geographics API is actually only used in step number one, where we're reading data to use in our script. And then again, in step number six, where we're pushing data back into the geographics database. All the rest is just regular Python scripting. You can use any library, any functions, uh, any uh, manipulation of that data that you want. And that's the beauty of this API. You have access to everything in your geographics project and you can use it and run any and all Python scripts that you want to utilize uh, for your workflows and then push the relevant data back into the database. So that's the workflow that we will be following. And now let's take a look at the data that we that we will be running this on. Now in Wellbase, I have five wells in this project and three of these wells have DT curves in there. So let me switch to a filter, which will filter this list to show me the three wells that have DT curves. I'm gonna switch my hot list to curves here so that you can, sh you can see the DT curve right here. Um, all these three wells have a DT curve. And I'm going to use these wells called T1 and T2 to train my model because I have some input curves that I can use and I have a, a sonic curve. So I have, a, I have known inputs, I have known outputs uh, that I can use to build my model. And I'm going to use well B1 as my blind testing well. So I'm going to uh, use the input curves here, predict a sonic curve, and then compare that sonic to the actual sonic curve, which is also present in this well. And then for the other two wells, uh, I have a filter called no DT wells. Now these wells are P1 and P2. They have curves in there, but they don't have a sonic curve. Um, so we'll use our model that we built using wells T1 and T2 to predict that sonic curve and then uh, you know, push that back into the database so that DD curve is available here as well. Uh, so let's get back to the script. Uh, now running the script is with Jupyter Notebooks, you can run it you know, cell by cell. The first thing you'll have to do is import all the libraries that you wanna use. Now the first half here is just your standard uh, you know, Python libraries that you want to be using, stuff like NumPy, Pandas, Seaborn for your plotting and stuff like that. Um, but the geographics API is these two lines. The first one is uh, just accessing all the well and project data features that we have uh, contained in this package, in this library. And then the second one is basically not so much accessing the data, but visualizing it. So we've made a couple of lock curve viewers uh, so that you don't have to code um, you know uh, lock tracks yourself you can actually use these to visualize your log data more easily we also have viewers for seismic data but in this workflow example we'll be using some of those log data so this is not you know specific to geographics but it's just to help you visualize data a little more easily without having to write a whole bunch of code every time you want to plot a log curve uh, so that's what this does but this one here is the key uh, a library that you want to use because this will give you access to all the well data, everything in the database, everything in the project uh, that we're going to be using. Uh, so we run that and make sure that you run it so that we have all those uh, available here. Um, now we get to the actual script. And the first thing you have to do is to connect the to the active project. Now this is required. You have to run this Python script on a workstation that has uh, you know an active project. Uh, so it'll go in and connect to your active project and that will make all of the other APIs available. If you don't connect to the project, you won't be able to access data in that project. Uh, next, I'm going to get a list of all the well filters that I have available in this project. So I'm going to run my API called 
called get well filters it's going to return a string uh, which i'm going to read into this variable here and that's just basically all the filters all the well-based filters that i have available now now this is a demo project i have only a handful of filters here um, in real projects that our users have there's going to be hundreds of filters uh, and just passing through this giant list of filters um, not really you know something that you you want to do and that's where you know programming in python in particular in just one line, I'm able to sort through this list and find wells that have the words DT in there. All right, so both my filters, DD wells, no DD wells, have the words DT in here. And when I run this, I can very quickly find filters that match DT, that have the words DT in there. So two filters, DD wells, and no DT wells. Once I know my filters, I want to be able to run them to get a list of UWIs that match those filters. Um, and that's what I'm doing here. I'm going to run first. Uh, this this API called get wells UWI. I'm going to pass it the filter. If you don't pass it the filter, it's going to return all the wells in my project. But if we pass it a filter as a string, it's going to only return UWIs that match this filter string. So I'm running two filters, uh, reading all the wells that are in the uh, in the DT wells filter into this variable, and then running this same API a second time, getting all the wells that don't have DT into the second well. Uh, and that's that's what this does here. It's going to run and it's going to give me three wells that have DT, T1, T2, and B1. These are the ones I'm going to use for my training and for my blind testing. And then two wells that don't have DT, P1 and P2, which we will use, uh, you know, their input data to predict, use our model to predict those curves. All right, next, uh, we're going to get uh, curve information because we need that curve information to be able to predict our DT curve. Uh, now, curve data in geographics, uh, is organized into curve sets. So it's important we know which curve set we want to use. Um, there is um, the, the active curve set or the field data curve set that most people kind of are using. Um, so you can we have an API that will give you the name of the active curve set for any particular well. So passing, uh, you know, well number one, which is the first um, well in my list uh, with, with DT, that's T1. So uh, getting the active curve set for T1 Next, I'm going to get all the names of the curves in that curve set for well number one and, and print that out. So the well T1, active curve set is input one, and input one has 15 curves, and these are the mnemonics for those curves. Same thing for well number two, well T2. I'm going to read that into this well two variable, get the active curve set, get the names of the curves, and, and print them out, and just show them here what those curves are. Again, T2, the active curve set is input one, and it has also 15 curves, and these are their mnemonics. I'm kind of looking for common mnemonics here so that I can use those to build my build my model. Now, once I've done that, let's just pick a few uh, curves that we want to use. Let's say we end up with these six or seven curves that we want to use. We know are available in both these curve sets, also available in my uh, curve sets I want to predict in, in wealth that I want to predict the DT curve for. And of course, I need the DT curve because that's the output. That's the known output. So I need it to be able to train my model because I have to have that uh, for my machine learning algorithm to actually work. Uh, so I have this list of curves. Now I'm going to run the get curves data API to get the actual curve data for uh, these curves that I'm, I have listed here uh, in this curve set. Uh, and I'm doing it for both the wells, and I'm just printing it out for one of those curves. The curve data is returned as a, as a pandas data frame. Again, pandas is an open source Python library, very useful for for treating series of numbers. It's very easy to slice through it, manipulate it, uh, read it, and, you know, do machine learning magic with it. Um, and that's that's basically what the data frame looks like. Looks like it's basically a table with columns. And now the way we return curve data is that each column is a curve. So you can see that each of the curves that I passed here is returned in a column. And then each row is a specific depth sample. So this is the value of N fee at 188.5, which is basically not available. NEN stands for not a number. So it's a null value uh, for all of these curves, except for GR, which does have a value. here. So that's how it's it's got like 35,000 rows. It just gives you a preview of what's in that data frame when you're printing it, printing it like that. Um, and this is great for computers to be able to you know, read this data, numerical data, and analyze it, crunch the numbers. But human minds uh, would want to see a more visual kind of uh, display, being able to display this as curves, as graphs. And that's where that 
well log viewer API, the, the, the second library that we imported. That's where that comes into play because I can use that to very easily plot this data as log curves. And that's what I'm doing here for well number one and well number two. So I'm plotting this curve data as well logs in tracks and I can see the, all the curves for T1, all the curves for T2. So that gives me a good visual indication of what all data is in these curves. Uh, and I don't really have to write a lot of code to add all these separate tracks. So it shrinks down the amount of coding that you need to do uh, just to be able to display your logger. And that's basically reading all our data. We have all the data that we want to use uh, to, uh, to build a model, to train that model, and go forward with our workflow. So that's step one done. Now we're going to go into step two, which is getting that data and preparing it and processing it so that we can input it and use it to train our model. Um, now there's there's many different ways, many different uh, visualization schemes available, and I'm just kind of highlighting some of them uh, here. The first one is like a heat map, which goes through and gives me a correlation between all the different um, you know curves that I have. Um, and you can see here that the NP curve and the DT seem to have a very strong positive correlation. The rho B and DT seem to have a very strong negative correlation. Uh, pretty much good correlation all around, except for maybe with this RT curve. Which you can ignore for now because we will well, get to the reasons of why this this correlation is so low um and maybe the rop which is you know uh and, and the caliber as well uh but it's giving you you know the the linear kind of correlation between all these curves uh with one another and since we're interested in dt predicting dt we kind of focused on this column or this row to see how those correlations are. Uh, and let's say based on that, we decide that we don't like the ROP curve and we just don't want to use it, uh, even though it's not a good example because machine learning relies on more than just a linear kind of correlation between them. Uh, there's also geological factors at play. Uh, but let's say based on this, you decided the ROP curve is not worth it. You don't want to use it. Uh, and that's where, you know, that pandas data frame and the ability to manipulate data comes into play uh, because we say, hey, we don't want to use ROP, so just you know, pop it from the data frame, just drop it from the uh, data frame completely. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do here. Uh, I'm going to uh, use the dot drop function for the curve data one and curve data two data frames to give you a new data frame, which does not have that ROP curve in there. Um, next, machine learning algorithms typically don't like null values. They don't know what to do with them. Um, so it's important that we get rid of them. Any null values that exist in that uh, data, we have to get rid of them. Um, simple visualization here, which is just plotting all the data that I have, showing me all the null values of so the white spaces in these plots, um, is where I have no data in, the, in those data frames, in the curve data one and curve data two data frames. Um, and again, very easy to see where I don't have this data. And then just as easily as we dropped a column, we can go in and drop these entire rows where we don't have data. Um, and we just go in and say, NA, uh, and that's going to modify our curve uh, or our data frames so that all this missing value is gone. If I plot these curves again using my well log plotting API, you can see now it's being kind of displayed in this particular range with all curves where all curves have data. It is now not showing me depth samples where even one of those curves doesn't have any data. Again, that's required uh, for our algorithm to work uh, properly. Next, we're going to take both these separate data frames because right now I have curve data one and curve data two uh, reading from wells T1 and T2 respectively in two separate data frames. I'm going to combine them into a single data frame. I'm calling that raw data because this is still uh, kind of go needs to go through normalization and we have to unskew uh, the distributions, all that. Uh, and this is what that data looks like. Um, now, before we uh, proceed further, we also maybe want to get rid of this depth column because the depth has real no real uh, kind of impact on our DT, you know, log. We don't want the machine learning algorithms to kind of try to find that relationship in there. Uh, so we'll just like we did for the ROP curve, we're just simply going to drop that from the from the data frame, and we end up with only the log curves uh, that we have available here. Now, again, remember each row is representing a simple um, depth sample. So we can always recover that because we have this um, uh, information available still in curve data one and curve data two. All right, so let's uh, move forward now. Uh, we have our raw data uh, data frame. Now what we're going to do is display some charts to look at the data distribution. What does this data kind of look like when we plot it on some uh, plot it on a histogram and a box diagram? And this is pretty good at showing us the data distribution. 
because uh, again, we want it as close to a normal distribution as possible. And right away, you can see the RT curve scoot all the way to the left. And that's basically because it's log logarithmic curve. Um, so it is kind of, uh, yeah, you're going to expect some values here, most values here, and then some, you know, very big outliers that are kind of skewing this distribution. It's an easy fix, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But also the GR, and maybe the PEF, all of these also need to kind of move. Uh, we need to normalize these dis distributions a little bit, get them as close to a bell curve as we possibly can. Um, and, and to do that, uh, for the RT curve, it's a simple fix. We just take a log of those values, and I'll update that, uh, and that's going to kind of uh, fix this problem for us. Uh, now, when I use the describe function to look at these values, now I'm looking at, um, you know, just the simple statistics of each of these curves. I'm looking at the mean values, uh, the standard deviations and all that. And you can see the range of values is quite, quite large. Um, I have some, you know, averages close to zero. Um, I have DT averaging all the way up to 80. Um, but for our algorithm to work, we need all of this to be pretty much in the same ballpark. That means we need to normalize this data. We need to have numbers that are kind of close to one another. Um, and that's what we're, what we're going to do here next. I'm, here, I'm running the Gia Johnson normalization. Not, no particular reason, just something I found on the internet. You can run any preferred normalization method that you want here. I'm just passing that my, my raw data and normalizing it and then getting that back in a data frame and then describing that, looking at the statistics again. And I, you can see that it gets... Uh, you know, these values are a lot, a lot closer now. They make a little more sense. Uh, next, we've got to get rid of all our outliers. So I run that, and that's going to go in and remove all those uh, outliers. They're way out from our averages. Uh, and then we plot them again to see what all of this uh, pre-processing uh, and data preparation has done for us. And there's my RT looking a lot more like a normal distribution here. GR looking a little better as well. Uh, as are you know some of the other curves. So now our uh, our data is ready um, to to train a model. We have our inputs, we have our outputs, we have normalized everything, uh, we have kind of pre-processed everything, uh, and that raw data curve is now uh, uh, I, I've kind of read it into a variable I'm calling process data, with, which has run through all of those uh, processing steps that we just talked about. All right, so. Uh, to, to train the model, it's basically as simple as this, this two lines of code. Um, um, I'm going to read my DT curve, my processed DT curve, into this variable called Y, which donates my output. So that's my output. X is my input, which is everything else other than the DT curve, because we want to use all those other curves uh, in the process data data frame. Um, and Y would be my my DT. Um, I'm using a gradient boosting regressor, which is basically a decision tree. I'm using 10, uh, depth of level 10. And this line here, model gb.fit, the x being the input, y being the output, this is all that you need to write, basically train that model. So I run that, does its thing, it trains the model, and uh, there it is. That's it. I have a model. Um, I can, I can run some feature ranking, see what logs got the most weight, and the NP kind of as expected gets the biggest weight, uh, then the GROB. Um, so this is basically how the model kind of, uh, how much weight the model gave to each of these uh, log curves when it was uh, you know, coming up with the prediction. Um, so again, that's just, a, just an insight into how the model actually worked. Um, next, we're going to run our blind test. Now, this is where we uh, read the well B1, which was, the, remember, the well which had uh, a bunch of input curves and a sonic curve. But we did not use this well in the training of our model. And that was the point, to be able to run it uh, on a set of inputs, get a predicted output, and then compare that output with the real-world data. And that's what I'm doing at this line here. Where I'm re reading that DT curve into a variable called real DT. Then I'm uh, getting my input, which I'm calling blind X. Um, and then I have to put it through all of the different uh, processing steps. I have to pre-process this data as well. So I take my log, um, I do my normalization, I uh, do the, get rid of the skewness, get rid of the missing values, all of that stuff. Uh, and then I run my uh, prediction. This time I'm running a dot predict function instead of a dot fit function. 
uh, so model gb dot predict pass the input in read it into uh, a variable called blind y denormalize blind y and then i am going to be able to read that predicted um, predicted output now i'm going to use another one of our viewers uh, in the well logged viewer library which is a little more interactive than that static plus that i showed you earlier so we're going to plot it the actual curve which is you know from the well and the actual acquired dd curve and then the predicted dd curve uh, and we're going to see how well our model did in doing the prediction and this is the plot the green being my actual dt the red being my predicted um, i have them in the uh, you know in the same track as well so you can see and you can qc how well it kind of um, matches or poorly and you know if it didn't go well but in this case it does seem to match pretty well you know it's it's doing what it's what, what the red curve and the green curve kind of following each other pretty closely um, another way to verify the accuracy of this is to just do a simple you know correlation cross plot uh, and you expect a tight kind of correlation linear correlation between them which is exactly what we've got we're getting so we're happy with this um, you know or at least i'm happy with this i know that the the model did a good job of being able to predict it to show me this data uh, to to use the data to to predict uh, a dt curve um, now I'm going to save this model to the file. So, and, and you don't really have to do this, but it's nice to be able to save this model because then you can bring it up anytime without having to run through all those steps again. Because now you have a trained model that you like, uh, and we just run it and we save it um, at a file location, uh, and we can get to that later. Now we could run the, uh, the predictions directly because we have everything in memory, but just to show you as an example, I'm going to read that model again. So I, I saved that model right here. I'm going to use uh you know load that model into um a new variable called saved model and use that saved model to run it again not necessary for this script but you know if you had saved the model and you wanted to use uh in another project or you know come back to it at a later date uh, that's where the saving and loading kind of comes into play and now i'm going to use it to predict a curve right for the well p1 remember that does not have a td curve in there so i read data for my uh uh the curve data for the well p1 um i go through i get rid of the missing values i run the pre-processing on it i do the normalization and all that and then i'm using the predict function of the saved model uh to predict my y values on my output which is my tt denormalizing it uh, and that basically gives me the uh, the prediction curve that i that i needed so that's been run now i have uh, y value now i could plot it here as well but i would rather push it back into geographics and then be able to use it or view it in petrophysics uh the GBR petrophysics application to do all everything that i need to do here and that's what i'm doing here again because all curve data is structured into curve sets what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a new curve set uh and add this data as this curve into that new curve set i could always put it in the active curve set as well but just for the purpose of this example we're going to create a new curve set and i'm getting a start value stop value and step value for that curve set from the active curve set so that's the active curve set whatever is the start value for it i'm reading uh, the start value stop value and step values and then creating a curve set in this well the name of the curve set is python and i'm using the start step and stop values uh, for that particular curve set once i have that curve set i'm then uh, reading the depths and the values in two separate strings uh and passing them or two separate lists rather passing them into the save curve uh api which takes the well id the name of the curve set the name of the curve which i'm calling predicted dt uh the units and then the actual values of that curve uh, we run that that goes through uh created a curve set called python in the well p1 and then a curve uh you know uh called predict D, predicted dt um into uh, into that curve set called python uh then we disconnect from the project which means we've stopped using um you know any of these apis now let me go to the g for spectrophysics application let's open up the well p1 uh, and here um i can now uh display that curve that i did now one another feature that we're introducing in the 2022 version is the ability to uh, take data or take curves from different curve sets uh, and display them together on your log uh, on your log template. Uh, so this is kind of in, in the versions before 2022. This was limited to 
uh, showing only data from the field data curve set, but now we can actually add data from different curve sets. So I'm just gonna right click on this track, go to new curve, uh, click on the curve set, and that's my Python curve set that we just created. And in this Python curve set, I have a, my predicted DT curve that I wanna view. Um, that's the one we just um, kind of predicted, getting a range and everything, click OK. And if you scroll down to the depth interval that we have that data for, for this well, and there's my predicted DT curve uh, right there for, for this particular one. Um, so that's how you could go through, uh, you know, read data from the geographics database, uh, especially log data, manipulate it to come up with a new curve, predicted curve from existing curve data, and push that back into the geographics database. Now, this is like any other curve. You can use it in any of your workflows um, that you need it. Uh, that you need it for. So that was an example of supervised learning. The second example that I have for today, and I promise I'll keep this one short, um, is one of an unsupervised algorithm. Uh, this is more of a hands-off approach and unsupervised learning is used to train models on raw, unlabeled uh, training data. Uh, it is used primarily to um, identify patterns and trends uh, or to cluster similar data into groups. And my example is where I use um, some petrophysical parameters in zone manager to determine the quote-unquote trackability of rocks in a zone. Uh, the workflow is similar. Uh, we read data from geographics, this time from zone manager, pre-process it, and then run our machine learning, lear, machine learning algo uh, and write the results back into zone manager. I'm going to change my active project because, um, you know, to be able to work with this API, I need to make sure that my act project is activated. Let's just say no to that. Um, well-based reloads. Now this project has a lot more wells, a total of about 780 wells in here. Uh, but what I'm more interested in is zone manager because in here I have a zone that I'm calling frac zone. Uh, and for my frac zone, I have some some attributes that I can, uh, that I've calculated using metaphysical analysis. Uh, that's the GR and the average of the GR in this zone, the minimum horizontal stress resistivity and uh, and the young modelist to Poisson ratio ratio. Now I'm going to use these, and these are typically good indicators of practicability in a rock. Um, and I'm going to pass this to my uh, unsupervised learning, and in this case I'm using a k-means clustering to come up with the relationships between these uh, between these four parameters and try to interpret that, uh, use that to see um, if I can determine the practicability of the rock. Uh, and once I have that information, I'll push that back into the zone manager uh, here as as an attribute. Um, all right, so we have our project activated. We have the data that we uh, want to be using. Let's get back to our script. Um, the first thing here is to import all those libraries. Again, the, the one that we're using for geographics is this uh, project API. We run it to make sure that these are uh, these API are available. Uh, connect to my active project. This time it's connecting to this Python zone manager project that I just activated. Now I'm going to run this well UWI get well UWI API. I'm not going to pass it a filter. And what that does, it returns all of the wells that are in my project um, into this into this well list. I'm just printing a count here. So seven, all 779 wells are now I have their IDs in this list. Um, then I'm going to get the zones that are available in my project. I get a list of all zones, comes back as a data frame. Um, that's my frac zone. That's the one I'm interested in. I'm going to call that my zone of interest. Um, and then I'm going to get all the attributes uh, that are in my zone of interest. So I'm running the get zone attribute names uh, API. I'm passing, passing it the name of my zone of interest. Uh, and that's going to give me, you know, you know, it comes up with six zone attributes, the GR, minimum horizontal set, resistivity, YM slash PR, but also like the gross and the porosity, which are also in there, uh, but I really don't need them. So we'll be using these four um, zone attributes that we looked at earlier. And uh, that's the four that we're using. That's that's where we're setting it up. Now we go back into uh, zone manager using the get zone attribute values function, pass it that well list, those 779 wells, uh, the zone of interest, the name of the zone, that is my frac zone, um, and the list of attributes we want to get data for. Uh, it goes in, it returns that data again as a data frame, um, and I'm calling that raw data. Now, this takes a little bit of time to run because it's a lot of data that's trying to retrieve, 
um, and it should be coming up with it any moment. And there it is. Again, it returns about 779 rows. So each row in this data frame is a well. And then uh, I'm getting each of those attributes as a column. Now you could run this for multiple zones. So I could pass more than one zone here and each zone will come back with the, the attributes that are in this list. Uh, and each column is kind of, uh, has the zone name kind of attached to the name of the attribute. So you know which zone that's coming in from. So that's how this data frame is kind of structured. Um, we don't need the wells column because that has nothing to do with the frackability of that rock. So we're going to drop that from our list uh, and we're going to rename these columns um, just for improved readability. Uh, so we're basically dropping the name of the of the zone from in front of the uh, uh, in front of the attribute name and that's basically what I'm doing here and then describing it uh, again the describe uh, function will just take your data frame and give you some averages on it uh, the standard deviation minimum and you know all of these uh, percentile values and it's good to look at it because again uh, just like with the supervised learning we don't want this wide range of values we want everything to be kind of similar so we have to, in the similar ballpark so we have to normalize this data and that's basically the only pre-processing step that we need to run for this example again i'm using a year johnson method for normalization go through there again describe that look at the statistics and now everything is kind of you know in the in the same ballpark now we're going to run our unsupervised learning algorithm and I'm going to be running a k-means clustering. Now k-means is basically where you specify a number of clusters and then uh, you said you know I want to divide this into two clusters for example uh, and it's going to go through to look at basically do an n-dimensional cross plot figure out where all the clusters are so in this case two clusters and it's going to come up and, and show me those values that's basically what this k-means algorithm is trying to do here um, and I'm just going to run it with two clusters um, runs and now it's kind of going through doing all this clustering comes up with that complete cluster so now cluster is done but i do need to be able to visualize this data right um, and the first thing i have to do is get that data and convert it into a data frame a pandas data frame so that i can actually view it visualize it and that's what i've done here um, so each row here now i have this this extra column here for each row which is giving me those same uh, parameters, which are denormalized, by the way. So I'm doing that denormalization right here. Um, get my, uh, restore my, my zone attribute values to what they were. And then I have a new column here called cluster. And this is giving me, dividing it into two clusters, cluster zero and cluster number one. Now, I really don't know what these clusters mean so far, um, but what I've done is try to uh, divide this data into two clusters. And I'm hoping one of them will be a high frackability, frackability, high frackable rock, and the other one would be, you know, not so highly frackable. Now, I chose two uh, clusters. You could go with three, four, however many you know. So you know, it could be low, medium, high, um, or or any any of those scales. But for me, zero or one, you know, one of these clusters is low frackability, and the other cluster is high frackability. Uh, so now. Again, the data frame is here. I do want to be able to visualize this. I do want to look at, you know, what each of these, what uh, the, the values in each of these clusters. So what I've done here is I've taken this data frame, I've rearranged it so that I can now look at the averages for each of these parameters for that cluster. So cluster number zero is giving me an average GR of 366. Cluster number one is giving me an average GR of 221. All right, and same thing for my horizontal stress. Cluster zero seems to have a higher stress, higher resistivity, and a lower YMPR ratio compared to cluster one. So that's what these averages are telling me. So that's some insight into my data. But the real kind of uh, value here is, or uh, is the ability to do these pair plots. Um, now the pair plots are kind of arranged, are basically you know cross plots for each of these parameters, one against the other. Uh, and again, this is color coded by my cluster numbers. So the orange here is my uh, cluster number one and the blue is my cluster number zero. That's the legend right over here. Uh, and you can see the average and uh, the because the GR, you know, you can't really cross plot it get, or get any real valuable information out of cross plotting GR with GR. Uh, so instead it's giving me a histogram, which is telling me Again, that same information that 
the average for class number one seems to be lower than the average for class number zero. Uh, then the second plot is my GR against my horizontal stress, and that's labeled down here. Um, and it's telling me that, you know, this is where, you know, the, uh, the class number one uh, points, sample points live. This is where class number zero sample points are found. The one is GR and resistivity. The fourth one is GR and YMP, uh, YMPR. Uh, and that kind of gives me an insight into what my clusters are kind of looking like, what they're doing. And based on this, then I can uh, try and interpret, try and label, uh, like, I, like I look at this and I say, all right, typically, you know, highly frackable rock has, um, you know, low GR, um, high, low, low stress, high uh, ratio, YMPR ratio, or whatever your interpretation of these results is. And then I'm going to go in and say, okay, based on my analysis, based, based on looking at these data, I think plus number one is uh, is not highly frackable and plus number zero is highly frackable. So that's that's the dictionary I've said. That. I go in there and, and read that cluster number. And wherever you find zero, replace that with high. Wherever you find one, replace that with low. And drop the cluster column and instead add that post data column in there. Uh, and that's basically what I've done here. Um, I run it again, the cluster column is gone. Instead, I get this frac potential column and the ones replaced with uh, the, the words low and zero replaced with the words high. Um, so I have this new attribute that I can then add to my zone manager as a zone attribute. Now I'm going to call that new attribute frac pot and that's what I'm uh, kind of calling it here. And then I'm going to create a zone attribute add it to my zone of interest, which was the frac zone. Uh, that's the name of the attribute. And because it's a text-based attribute, I set my is numerical attribute flag to false. Run that, that goes in and creates that attribute in the zone. It doesn't, it really hasn't added any data yet because I'm just creating that attribute, adding it to the zone. And this uh, function where I'm setting the zone attribute value in this zone for this attribute for all the wells in my well list, so that's all my uh, 779 wells and from my data frame the post data data frame I'm getting the frac bot value converting it to a list and passing that along and it and the attribute values for 779 wells have been saved, saved successfully I disconnect from my project um, and then we go back to our zone manager we will refresh all our data um, and this time let's go to our layout um, and add this new attribute, the frackbot attribute that shows up right here. Um, sorry, that became a lot larger than I expected to. Click OK, and there's my frackbot column. Uh, so we went through, used the data that we had in here, uh, came up with clusters. So ran an unsupervised learning algorithm, k-means in this case, came up with you know relation. The the algorithm came up with relationships between these data, uh, how it saw it structured, and then we assigned or interpret those values and assign uh, a zone attribute, which we then um, add it to zone manager. Um, right, and that brings me uh, to to a, uh, to a close uh, for this demonstration. We went through um, everything that the Geographics Python API has to offer. Um, you know, it, it lets you access all your Geographics data, including well data. Um, zone manager attributes, your grids, your seismic, um, and it's incredibly easy to set up. And then uh, it's designed so that you really don't uh, need to uh, you know, do much uh, in terms of being able to, uh, to consume those API. You just need to uh, import them into either existing scripts so you can replace your data source from you know CSV files or spreadsheets or whatever you're using currently for for getting data into your scripts and just replace that with the Geographics API to connect directly to the database, get the data you need, do the calculations you want to do, uh, and then push relevant data back into the database. And with that, thank you all for, for attending, for uh, listening, and